Many of you know I'm a true advocate for taking supplementation to optimize your health, and one of the best things you can do is choose the right collagen. Collagen is a building block to your entire body. I was introduced to Sparkle Wellness product Skin Boost Plus about a year ago, and I've been taking it ever since. Now, they've launched a new bone strength product that I'm super excited about. New Osteo Boost Collagen is formulated to improve bone mineral density, something we all need to think about as early as age 40. Made with award-winning collagen peptide known as Fortibone, the product really has led to meaningful results for people who need significant improvement in this area, including those suffering with fractures or broken bones. Osteo Boost is a great choice for anyone over the age of 40 to reduce the risk of bone mineral density loss, a major precursor to the diagnosis of bone-related diseases. Right now, you can get any of the Sparkle Wellness Collagen Supplements from Amazon or from their website, lovesparkle.life, and use my code DRFIT for 20% off. That's D-R-F-I-T at lovesparkle.life for 20% off their new product, Osteo Boost. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie, and welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. It is so fantastic to have you here today. I'm super excited. I've got two total boss babes here on the podcast today, but you guys, they know how to get their hands dirty. I cannot wait to talk about today's topics, but I want to introduce you to Natalie and Tara. They are the co-hosts of Discover Ag docuseries, as well as the popular podcast Discover Ag. Collectively, they've been advocating for agriculture online on various social media platforms for over 10 years. Together, they've fostered a community of over 210,000, spoken on stages across the nation and globe, and empowered a community to reconnect to the agriculture industry and the hands that feed us. Natalie and Tara, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Yeah, thanks for having us on. We're excited. Very excited. We were just chatting. I mean, how cool is media, really, honestly? So Natalie and I are in Nebraska. Go Big Red. (laughs) Dara's in New Mexico. So I love this. I love this. Well, let's get started. I was just asking you guys before we started recording how they ever got interconnected. And it was all through social media, which is how I've become friends with so many other people in the health and wellness space. It has really opened up just this alignment, you know, for people that are are doing a lot of the same things. And I think it really helps amplify some of these messages. So before we dive into the conversation, I just want to applaud you both because that takes a lot of extra effort to, you know, meet and foster that relationship and, and to build the things that you're building. So I a huge round of applause to that. Well, I'll open it up to either one of you. Let's talk about why people hate meat so much. (laughs) I had a patient this week And I ask all my patients about their diets. And she said, "Um, actually, I eat a very healthy diet. I don't eat any red meat. That's what she said. Of course, it took me aback just a little bit off my stool. (laughs) But (laughs) give me your opinion. Why why, Why is there an onslaught against red meat right now? Oh man, like talk about a tough question right out the gate. Uh, I feel like there, it's a lot of different reasons. I feel like we have had a lot of um, misguided, I guess is the word I'll use, nutrition advice, I feel like in this country over the last 20 or even 30 years now. Um, and then I think combining that with a conversation around sustainability and climate change, which there's also a lot of misguided information out there around the conversation of cattle and climate. And I think those two like forces together um, have really created like a perfect storm for the meat and dairy industry, the animal protein industries. But on a positive note, I do feel like we're kind of maybe like swinging the other way now and people are starting to be more open and um, understanding and and curious, maybe food curious about the animal proteins. And uh, I personally have been excited to see that in the last few years. Yeah, we're going to dive into everything that you mentioned there. Natalie, you got anything to add? Yeah, I wanted to add that I think the way we have progressed as a society, which, you know, pros and cons, uh, we have a lot of headlines we absorb through social media and just the way we get our news now. And I think that's one of the hard things about the food and agriculture industry is when it comes to things we're talking about, they are deeper conversations. You know, they're nuanced, they're complex, there's lots to consider, lots to talk about. And then, 
you know, news outlets or social media posts or influencers or uh, celebrities, you know, whatever the form is, they get to put out a very quick four or five words, you know, I'm eating a healthy diet. Cows are killing the planet. You know, it, it's just quick and people, people see it and they consume it and they kind of don't go the layer deeper. And I think that's another thing we're up against too. Yeah. Yeah. I feel that it's deeply political, um, but there are so many misconceptions. I do agree with you, Tara. I feel like we're, we're kind of seeing the pendulum swing a little bit and maybe it's just because of the bubble I live in that I hear more people kind of talking about this, you know, can we do it in a sustainable way? But then I guess on the same, you know, flip side of the coin, I get DMs all the time. Does red meat cause cancer? Are you sure I'm not going to die from eating this much red meat? I, you know, like, so even in the medical world, when you talk about being headline readers, there's even doctors and medical providers that are, I don't want to say headline readers on social media, but even studies, right? They just read the abstract of the study. Oh, you know, and then they don't go down to the, the, base and meat and potatoes of the study to realize that it was a horrible study and that there's so many confounding variables and that we can't actually show that there's causation for, you know, whatever the headline or, you know, claims. So that is a difficult part, uh, in, in our industry too. So of course, one of the big things that people argue about is the environmental impact that beef are bad for the environment. Can you dispel that or maybe tell us maybe what risks there are to our environment with, with the beef industry? So it kind of goes to actually those studies that you were just talking about. I think one of the things that kicked off this conversation was the UN um, report called Livestock's Long Shadow. And it was one of those reports, exactly as you said, people read the headline, they read the abstract and get, didn't get into it. And it claimed, it had some big claims that animal ag was a much larger emitter than they actually are. And, and some of the details kind of behind that are, is for animal ag, they looked at the life cycle assessment. So the entire, like every single piece of animal agriculture, but for something like transportation, they looked at just tailpipe emissions. So they didn't look at what went into building the car. How does the car decompose? What happens to the batteries? None of that was considered an emissions. And so you were literally comparing two different things to each other. And you know, once that bell is rang, it's kind of hard to unring it and like go back. They have since retracted pieces of that study and come out and said, you know, you know, I, agriculture is a lot less than that, but you can't, you can't unsing that, uh, that or unring that bell. And so here in the United States, animal ag actually accounts for less than 5% of total greenhouse gas emissions. And then beef is even less and dairy is even less than that. Like that is the total number. And that is something that surprises a lot of people when you just hear it just like plain like that, like, cause we see so many of these headlines that claim things a lot different. And, um, and so that's like the first thing. And then we can kind of get down into the nitty gritty of actually how cattle have a positive impact, but that is their impact as it stands today. Natalie, anything to add to that? Yeah. The other thing I think is kind of interesting that no one quite talks about whether we're in agriculture or not the outside of it, but like Tara said, um, 5% is about what animal agriculture accounts for. 11% is what total agriculture accounts for. So that means animal agriculture and plant agriculture is actually about equal when it comes to our total greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, that's interesting. You said, I tried to look up the numbers before we came on here. I'm a gynecologist. So I'm like, you know, I'm going to do a little research. <laughs> I do that before my podcast. And I found total ag 9% and beef was 3.9. So you're exactly right. Actually less than half if you do that math. Yeah. And so it's really crazy that there um, is, again, this narrative that, you know, if you want to have the healthier, cleaner, more sustainable diet, you go the plant plant option. And, um, you know, we can even argue that from a nutritional standpoint, maybe in a little bit, but if, even if you're looking at it from a number standpoint, when it comes to, you know, our planet and taking care of it, it's like, there's not much difference, um, between animal agriculture and plant agriculture. Okay. So when you're talking about environmental impact and greenhouse gas emission, I want to break this down to like the level that my 10 year old can understand it. So they're reading the headlines that essentially cow farts are burning holes in our <laughs> ozone layer. So methane production by cattle versus uh, carbon dioxide and CO2 sequestration. So there's a difference. You were kind of talking Tara about the, you know, the, the, the life of these uh, quote unquote pollutants. And I read a little bit online that there's some differences between methane and CO2. Can you give us like a really kindergarten level <laughs> lesson on that at all? Yeah, we have actually a really great example that we got from a climate uh, expert who, I mean, all he does is study this and it's such a great example. So methane is a shorter lived gas. So it only lives in our atmosphere about 10 years and it's broken down compared to CO2, which lives for over a hundred years in our atmosphere. 
Uh, methane is more potent, but you have to consider the fact that it breaks down and is really a part of like that natural biogenic carbon cycle. And then some numbers about methane, methane, half of methane produced is actually natural sources from like wetlands, different things like that. Half is uh, caused by humans, but only one third of that half is actually caused by animal agriculture. The rest is things like landfills, um, other types of ag production, like rice patties. Like there's a lot of things that go into methane, but cattle obviously like kind of capture the headline in that conversation. But the way that we had it described to us is CO2 is like a bathtub filling up with a plug in it. If you have the water faucet running in your bathtub, it is just going to start overflowing right onto the floor. And that's what CO2 is because it doesn't break down very quickly. Whereas methane is like a bathtub with the plug out. And so when the plug is out and the water is filling up, it's going to continue draining because methane is breaking down that quickly. It's breaking down just as quickly as it's being put back into the atmosphere. So it's a more stable level versus the CO2 that is continuing to increase in the atmosphere. And you said, I mean, humans breathe off CO2. So, I mean, there's a lot of people in the world these days, right? I don't know, what is it at, 8 billion now or something like that? So, I mean, there's a lot of the excessive CO, I mean, where does the vast majority of the CO2 come from? I think you said a third comes from humans or a, th and, or a third of what comes from, say that yeah, one more so time. Uh, for methane, half comes from natural sources and half is like human produced. And then within that, there's different sectors of it. Okay. And a fun fact about the methane, you said cows farting. They actually burp because they're ruminant animals. And we can get into how cool ruminant animals actually are. The fact that they are burping methane instead of farting methane. But um, yeah, that's kind of like that side of the methane conversation. Yeah. Well, let's just dive right into that. So cows are an amazing creature that can eat grass and turn it into fat and protein and nutrients and all the things that humans can survive on. So Natalie, Tara, one of you, give us a little bit of a veterinary lesson here about uh, <laughs> cow nutrition. <laughs> How do they do this magic? Well, I'm glad you are asking us to explain things that your 10 year old could understand, because that is how I will explain the anatomy when it comes to cattle. I'm always, whenever I get asked this question, I'm always like, oh, I wish I could like phone my husband in for the conversation because he got his master's in ruminant nutrition. So he can like fully give, you know, all the nitty gritty details. Um, but essentially ruminants, which would include cattle, it also includes like bison, sheep, goat, deer, elk, all of those are what are called ruminant animals. And they're classified that way because they are not monogastric. So they, you know, a chicken, a pig, us as humans, we all have like one stomach. We have one system that is working when it comes to, you know, our digestive system. Cattle have four. And so it's a very, very unique, um, you know, anatomy and physiology they have going on. And because of that, there's actually like microbes in the um, gut system. And, you know, this, it's this very intricate system. But like you said, because they are built that way, they're able to take, um, you know, all the things we cannot consume as humans, number one being, you know, cellulose grass, and they get to upcycle it. That's the fancy word we like to use. And like you said, they turn it into that protein, you know, that we can. So they really are because of the way they're built, they take inedible things, and they make it edible for us, which like you said, is really, really cool. A fun fact about that too is they actually have microbes in their gut that um, Natalie used the word upcycling. So they turn 60 grams of incomplete protein from grass cellulose into 100 grams of complete protein that we can eat. They are literally the only thing on the planet, animal or plant or anything that can actually upcycle protein and make more protein than they consume and change it from incomplete to complete. So it's a really cool process when you get down into like the science and the nitty gritty of it. Wow. That's cool. It's like little Super Mario brother, like hitting the star. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. Look at all this awesome protein. Um, okay. So let's, so we talked about beef eating cattle or beef eating cattle. Sorry. The, the, the cows aren't eating each other right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we try and not do that. Yep. Generally. <laughs> uh, we talked about the cattle eating grass, but that's not how, that's not what all conventional beef is. So let's dive into the conventional beef industry a little bit. So for somebody that their whole life, they've just gone to the grocery store, they bought, they went, you know, went up to the meat counter, bought their ground beef steaks, whatever it is. Give us a little bit of education on the conventional beef industry, because there is definitely a difference between conventional and what you guys are really advocating for, you know, regenerative ag. Yeah. So, um, there is a lot of, um, I guess just unknown about the beef industry. It's a very segmented industry, which I don't think people are aware of either. 
um, beef really gets lumped in with like chicken and protein, like all animal proteins get lumped in together. Um, and it's kind of one of my soapboxes to like dissect beef out of that because we are a very, very different um, supply chain. So pork and um, chicken are going to be usually what's called vertically integrated. So for example, a Tyson will own from finish to end of, you know, the whole system, essentially, they own from, you know, the egg starting to the packaged meat that you were buying at the grocery store. Um, The beef system is not that way. It is um, broken down into a couple different sectors. Um, And when you talk about, you know, um, I always say like, quote, unquote, regenerative versus quote, unquote, conventional, because I actually think there is more meld between them than some people are aware of. Okay. Um, But when it comes to that, the beef system, Whether an animal is uh, grass finished, which would be, you know, typically thought of as the more regenerative route uh, versus the corn, you know, grain finished, which is typically associated with the conventional, um, two thirds of that animal's life is actually spent out on grass, out at pasture. Um, So it'd be on a ranch like my family's uh, here in Nebraska. And um, we are in charge of raising that. We call it a pair. It's a mama and a baby together. And so they're out at pasture. The baby's getting mama's milk and grass. And that's basically what it's getting for its diet um, all the way up until a certain weight. And again, it it usually ends up being about two thirds of their life. And so that looks the exact same, whether you're again going for that grass finished um, model or that conventional model. The difference you enter into um, with the grass finished versus the uh, grain finished is kind of at the end of their life. So about the last four to six months. And that's when in uh, grass finished, it would typically stay, you know, back out on grass, um, whereas in conventional would enter a feedlot and then it's going to have grains entered into its diet. Um, And corn does get a pretty bad rap right now um, within, you know, I guess society or culture as a whole. And I was actually reading a a pretty recent study out of Oklahoma State uh, that said when you look at the entire diet of the beef animal, um, corn only accounts for about 7% of the diet from start to finish. So even those grain finished animals, um, it is a very small portion because when they are in the feedlot or when they are getting finished with that grain, they're still getting grasses, they're still getting forage, they're still getting other things that are mixed into the diet. Um, the corn is actually a very small part of it. But that, I think, is um, I kind of went on a what little is bit the, of a What long is the answer, rest of but... it? Like wheat, barley? I mean, what else are they getting if it's not corn? So, I mean, it just probably depends geographically, you know, so in our area, we have a lot of um, corn and ethanol. So they're getting distiller's grain, which is a byproduct of that. Um, You can get almond hulls, you can get orange pulp, you can get alpha. Yeah, I mean, there's like a ton of things. Actually, 86% of a cattle's diet is going to be all those things humans can't eat. And it's usually leftover um, products from other agriculture systems. Yeah. So on the dairy side of things, like our cattle are not out on pasture. They are in like confinement where, um, and we can get into this more in a minute, but, um, I think that's actually like, I love the cattle, the ruminants out on grass as Natalie talks about, like, it's really cool for the ecosystem. It's amazing. Like it's part of soil health, but on the flip side of the coin for us, our our cows diet still play an important role in sustainability because they eat so many of those byproducts that Natalie was talking about. And I kind of hate the word byproducts because it's like, it makes it sound bad, but there's so trash. many. Yeah. yeah. And that's not what we're doing. But like when you, for example, make cotton, there's a seed left over called cotton seed and we feed it to our cows and it's actually a really great source of protein. And that's just one example. Natalie mentioned like uh, pulp from citrus, you know, almond holes, like it's very specific to where you're at of what could be used for cattle feed that's like left over from making like human foods or human clothing. And we work with a nutritionist that actually plans our cow's diet so that they know exactly which ingredients we're mixing into their ration is what it's called, but their feed, and then make sure they're getting a good mix. And, and as Natalie said, I mean, it still includes a ton of, you know, alfalfa, which is grass and, and haze and, and all those things you think of as traditional cow's food, but we're able to utilize a lot of other products that would otherwise end up in landfills. And if they ended up in landfills, we'd be increasing admissions on those products. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget watching this Dirty Jobs episode with Mike Rowe years ago about um, this pig farm in outside of Las Vegas, and they would take the leftover buffet food and truck it out to this pig farm. (laughs) They're like dumping it in this little trough that's like conveyor belt thing. And there's just like bagels floating in it. And the pigs are just like, (laughs) I'm like, oh my God. But it was just going to go in a landfill, right? So like, I, you know, I love the idea. Does it change the flavor profile of the beef? 
having, depending on what the nutritionist decides to put in, I mean, you say like citrus and things, does it ever change the end profile at all? So Um, from a, from a dairy side, so the milk would be what we'd be like looking at the uh, profile. Again, there's so many different things being put in the feed. Like it's not like, I mean, yeah, if you put like 50% citrus pulp, I'm sure the milk would taste slightly different. But since it's this combination, um, they've done research on this and done a whole bunch of like taste palette analysis, and it does not change it enough for people to notice. Um, And again, it's regional. So, uh, you know, there's still those like basics that are being fed in the diet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We visited a, um, a Colorado craft beef one time when we were leaving uh, Colorado, coming back to Nebraska and they were kind of giving us the tour. And yeah, he said they'll get uh, from the breweries in Colorado, they'll get hops, they'll get mm-hmm. all sorts of different things that they will add into the cow's diet. So if I'm, if I'm, uh, I own a bunch of cattle, how do how does one determine, I mean, obviously there's a market for grass fed, grass finished beef. Um, but is it what the pat, like we're going through a really bad drought. Like Natalie pr- probably can, you know, tell you what Nebraska is like right now. It's bad. Like we haven't gotten any rain, like, or how does one determine, is it just that the, there's more money and profit doing grain finished? What's the, what's the advantage or disadvantage for, for a farmer? You mean how do they choose if they want to uh, do like grass finished beef first? Yeah, grain yeah finished? exactly, exactly. Yeah, um, I mean, I think it would be from the very beginning of how they want to set up their operation, and I think a lot of it is going to be due to like geographically, um, like Tara down in New Mexico. I don't know like what percentage of you know ranches down there are even grass finished or like you know. I mean, it's just very. You have to have really good rainfall. You know, you have to have have right. access to um, gotta have grass. <laughs> Yeah. And then even if you, I mean, obviously, I mean, I know people who do grass finished in there, you know, they still live where like snow falls. So it's not like it's like fresh grass, you know, if you're still giving that like, Hey, um, alfalfa, those things that are processed, um, you know, grown in the summer and then bailed and feed it later on. I think it, you know, it would still count, but, um, you, you have to have access to all that. And I guess your operation has to just be set up in the way that, you know, you can provide that high um, protein diet, like meet all the animals requirements with where you're at for your operation. Okay. Yeah. We went to, that? yeah, we went okay. to Yellowstone this winter to do snowmobiling and we watched these bison use the people on YouTube. I'm making like a gesture towards my forehead, but they would use their large head. It had a name, but they would move the snow and they would get down to eat, you know, the like, frozen dead grass <laughs> underneath there. I mean, it obviously has nutrients. They make it through the winter. So that's, that's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. Let's talk about other things in the conventional beef industry. Hormones. Are hormones used in conventional beef? When are hormones used in raising cattle? Is there an appropriate use of them? Yeah, I am not very familiar with hormones. We don't use them on our ranch at all. Um, so I don't know. I don't have, I guess I have a ton to add to it. I should do more research on uh, people who are using them so I can better answer that. But I, the ranch I grew up on, um, we never used them. And then my ranch, we don't use them either. So I'm not even sure, I guess, like the percentage um, of what's used. I mean, in I have to industry. imagine it's like, it's like the bodybuilding industry, like, right. I would assume that they would be using them to make a cow bigger so that they can get more exactly. poundage at, at the end. Yes. It would be, they're using them for like a growth stimulant essentially. Yep. Okay. And on the milk side, you know, the hormone that always, I feel like comes up in conversation is if you pick up any gallon of milk, everyone looks at the RBST free or from cows not treated with RBST. And like a uh, interesting fact about that, there is actually no milk on the shelf in the United States from cows treated with RBST. And yet we still see the label on all milk. It's kind of, you know, labeling is a whole nother like can of worms that we can get into if we want, but um, it's a label because people look for that label, even though it's actually like a non-issue anymore. There are not dairy farmers using that. Um, the processors will not pick up your milk if you are using it. Uh, and so even though sometimes you may see a label like that, it doesn't mean that dairy, like no dairy farm is using that. Yeah. That's an interesting point you bring up because I've seen posts online about like eggs, for instance, what does free range mean? What does pastured mean? Give us some insight, I guess, with beef, with grass fed, grass finished, gr- organic beef. I see all sorts of things on the labels and you're right. These people are really good salesmen. So what, what should we be looking for on the labels at the grocery store? 
So I think with labels, one of my things, I think with any of these conversations around organic, grass-fed, it really comes down to like your personal choices. Like it's not necessarily that one is inherently good or bad or whatever. They're just different. They're different farming practices. It's different um, strategies for, you know, how we're raising animals or producing food. Um, Natalie and I are both very food choice that people should be able to choose the food that works best for them within their budget, within where they can access it, like all of those things. And then like the label. So it's really about understanding like what's important to you. So organic, for example, would be a farming practice where you would not be able to give antibiotics to the animals. We can get in the antibiotics conversation that, you know, if you treat an animal with antibiotics, whether that's on the beef or the dairy side, there is a withhold or withdrawal period where that animal can not enter like the food supply system until all of the antibiotics have cleared from their system. And then they're able to like be processed or we're able to then milk them for milk for human consumption. So there is no antibiotics, quote unquote, in milk or meat on the shelves anywhere because of that withhold period. But if you want an animal that's never been treated with antibiotics, like organic would be your choice. Doesn't make conventional wrong for giving antibiotics. I mean, the antibiotics are prescribed by a vet and all of those things. And it's similar with the grass versus grain finished, um, you know, and those mean different things. Grass fed can mean that it's had grass throughout its life. It doesn't mean that it's grass finished. Grass finished means it did not go to a, a feedlot style conventional um, like people think of. It can, it also doesn't mean they're out on pasture though. Grass fed can mean that they were given grass like in a bunk setting, in a pen setting, not necessarily in a pasture. So there's, there's just a lot of variation and a lot of um, the labels are actually like not regulated. Like the word natural doesn't mean anything. There, there's no regulation. Organic is, it's certified USDA organic, um, but they're, there's just a lot like to the label conversation. I'll let Natalie kind of jump in and maybe give her two cents too. I think what's important to remember when it comes to label, you know, if we're honing in on like the beef labels is that they are not a, um, they're a, basically a diet label for the animal. They are not an, a nutrition label. Like it does not equate to nutrition for humans and it does not equate to welfare for the animals either. Like Tara said, even a grass finish, you could have an operation that maybe the cattle are in um, confinement and they that's just what their diet was, was grass the entire time. Because again, they could be out at the beginning or, you know, summertime or seasonally dependent. They could be out on actual grass, but then again, seasonally dependent, they could be getting grass in their diet and, and not out at pasture. And so I think that's what's important most important to remember is that those labels just equate to what the animal was fed and they don't necessarily mean that one is healthier or unhealthy for you and one means the animal was treated better or worse. Okay. That makes sense. That makes sense. Um, talk to us about the um, impact of cattle grazing. There's a lot of, when we talk about this environmental argument that, you know, they take up so much land. Um, give us some insight into this. I know when I visited, uh, Colorado craft beef, they were telling me in this particular area, there's so much sand. I mean, you couldn't even use that for any, to grow crop, you know? So give us some insight about cows and land and, and, uh, what we're dealing with. Yeah. So is that Jeff and Cara? Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm really big fans of them. I've never met them in person, but I've listened to a podcast. Lovely, been on or two. lovely people. Yeah. Really yeah, small his, operation, but really good his people. His and mine, um, belief systems align really well. Um, so I've always been a big fan of like what he has to share, but, um, yeah, similar to where they, you know, they're probably, I'm guessing they're like similar or close to the border of Nebraska. Yeah. Because as you know, Nebraska has the Nebraska Sandhills, which is actually what our ranch borders. Um, and it's my favorite thing to show off in social media because most people think of Nebraska as like flat and cornfields and that is it, which we definitely have those. <laughs> I'm not denying you will not see that if you are driving down the interstate. Um, but there's a very large portion of Nebraska that is what is known as the Sandhills. Um, and it is a very lush grass grassland ecosystem. It's actually the world's most intact ecosystem still. And the reason it is that way is because of grazing cattle. It would not be suited for anything else. And those grazing animals have been played a really important part in maintaining the grasslands and the ecosystem. Um, so you're ex exactly right. Um, you know, there are areas of the land. I think people just assume that when they hear that large statistic that, you know, animals are using, you know, X percentage, whatever, number of people like to cherry pick to make, you know, their, uh, viewpoint wowing. Yeah. Um, 
lots of times it's because that's all it could be used for is a grazing animal. So it's like, it gets into the conversation, what's called arable versus non-arable land. And basically it means that a large portion of, you know, land here in the U S and globally is too rocky, too steep, too arid, you know, it is not suited for growing crops. Um, and where we're at on the Nebraska sand hills is a very perfect example. Like you would not be putting crops out, um, on those grasslands, you know, that's why it's still intact is because we were able to keep it that way with animals. Um, and so, yeah, there's that part of it. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the reason the grasslands are so intact is because the animals grazing, um, you know, soil health is really important, which also loops back to the whole conversation of, um, you know, carbon reduction, you know, uh, carbon our, our soil is actually a carbon sink. It's that an industry, agriculture and industry, or, or excuse me, agriculture and forestry are the only industry that actually serves as a carbon sink, which means we can pull carbon out of the air. So if we want to get into like, again, cool things ag can do to be part of the solution. Um, yeah. It's maintaining our soils and animals are actually a huge part and play a very large role in maintaining soils. Um, so it's really cool when you get those ruminants out of um, pasture doing what they're supposed to be doing. Um, they're really integral to the system. How to, how do we sequester the carbon? I mean, how does how does that process happen between the cow eating the grass and... Yeah. So it gets really into the soil health uh, side of things. And so basically like, I mean, it goes from how their hooves compact the soil to them, you know, eating the grass to their manure being obviously put out on the land. Um, cow manure. So even in my setting where my cows are in a pen, we actually collect all of their manure and we compost it. And then our composted manure goes out to other farmers that are growing crops either to feed cows or do something else, um, grow, you know, food. And that cow manure, whether it's out on pasture or like in our setting where it's composted, it is one of the best ways to increase the organic matter in soil. Like you think about soil as like alive that, I mean, it is, and it should have organisms and you should dig in and see worms and just like tons of microorganisms and organic matter is essentially like the food for those microorganisms and cow manure is an excellent source of that. You know, you think about like fertilizers, like synthetic fertilizers or just all the different fertilizers that are out there. You may be getting like certain components of soil health, but like manure can give you kind of like that full broad spectrum of all the things a soil needs to be healthy. Um, and so there's so many pieces of the cow in different ways that are beneficial to that soil health. And so the yeah. healthier the soil is, the more carbon it can actually take up. It's good to put manure in your garden, you guys. So when someone tells you to eat shit, just say, yes, I will. Thank you. <laughs> My um, husband and I were actually at a garden center yesterday and he was like, what's this bag? And I guess he didn't like, he didn't really look it. at it. And yeah. I was like, it's cow manure. And he flipped it over and he was like, oh my gosh, it's just straight up cow manure. Like I, who knew I could yeah. bag it and sell it at Lowe's. Menards, like they got it, you guys. You just <laughs> pick up a bag. Okay. Put it in your I garden. Was... Beautiful flowers, tons of fruits and vegetables. <laughs> I was going to say what Tara was explaining to is a lot, uh, a lot of times what people you'll hear, uh, you know, regenerative ag talk about as carbon sequestration. And so it's kind of that cycle of the carbon photosynthesis going through the plant, the soil back out again through the animal. And it's like that, you know, rotating, um, I guess like the life circle. cycle. Yeah. Yeah. The circle of life. I love <laughs> it. Um, okay. Let's get into the, uh, nutrition of beef. And I would love for you to compare it to other animal proteins too, like pork and chicken, because my patients, a lot of times, like I said, I have this one woman this week that was like, I'm really healthy. I don't eat red meat. Uh, her diet was pretty much all chicken. Can you give us the, the lowdown on health and humans eating animal proteins? Yeah, that's such a good conversation. So you mentioned like the issues with some of those nutrition studies and like the causation versus correlation conversation. And one of the things about red meat, I think, is a lot of times uh, when we look at like different diets and compare them is red meat gets lumped in with a lot of other things. Like if you're a red meat eater, you're more likely to be a smoker or a heavy drinker or, you know, people often, you know, look at like a vegan diet versus like the standard American diet and then blame meat for the the problems that are there. And I think we can probably like, you know, all agree on the fact the standard American diet is very different than eating like a good piece of steak. Um, and so I think red meat, it's just like an interesting part of the animal protein because of um, different like correlations, but that doesn't mean causation. And when you really look at like the micronutrients and the macronutrients of, you know, steak, there's like, it's pretty much like second to none as far as like the nutrition powerhouse that it is uh, 
with being able to provide so many different nutrients that we need. Yeah. Yeah. Um, can you talk to us too, when it comes to nutrition with beef? Um, we've kind of talked about grass fed versus grain finished. And that's a question I get a lot too on social media. Is it healthier? Is it really healthier? Grass finished beef versus grain? There are some nutritional differences, but I think when it comes down to, um, like an actual effect, you know, a health effect on the body, um, it's not, um, why am I blanking on the proper way? You're, you would, <laughs> you know, it's, um, irrelevant, like irrelevant. Different. Yeah. It's not significant. A minuscule. Yeah. The differences yeah. are yeah, minute in the grand sense of, you know, your health and nutrient profiles and. Yeah. So one of the big areas that is pulled out and talked a lot about for the nutritional differences is the omega threes and sixes. Um, and I guess usually my personal viewpoint on that is if you're really looking to get the healthy omegas, you shouldn't be going to like beef anyway. Um, you should be looking at a lot of other sources. So if you're Mm -hmm. really trying to again, change that profile, I wouldn't do it through choosing like the grass finished over the grain finished. I would do it through other means. Um, so yeah, there are some, again, some differences. Um, but overall I, I feel really confident that whether you're eating the the conventional beef or the grass finished beef, you're getting all the proper macro um, and micronutrients that you need. It's going to be comparable. It's still better than plant proteins, right? (laughs) Tell us the difference between, because in medicine, there is this huge push for plant-based diets and I'm not really sure what it means. But I think the interpretation will be eat less meat and people will start eating more processed, high carbohydrate foods. That's my fear. That is when you vilify something in the diet, it will be replaced by something else. So talk to us about plant proteins versus animal proteins. Yeah. So plant proteins, um, we kind of, I talked about it from a cow side, but from a human side, I mean, plant proteins are typically incomplete protein. So they do not have all the amino acids, all the building blocks for a complete protein. Whereas animal protein, whether that is beef, dairy, those are complete proteins. Uh, and so we had a nutritionist actually on our podcast recently, we were kind of debunking game changers and the Mm. whole plant base there. And she acknowledged, she was like, you can get all the nutrients you need from a vegan diet, but you have to be very selective of which vegetables you're getting, really be looking at your entire profile of your diet. Whereas animal protein is just an easier source of complete protein. You don't have to be quite as aware. If you're getting a steak, you're getting everything you need. Whereas if you're getting a plant protein, you're going to need to be getting different plants with different of those incomplete proteins to make a complete protein in your system. And people often miss the mark on that. Like if they're not working with a nutritionist, not being really conscientious, they do end up filling their diet, as you said, with like more filler foods. And there's actually a really great statistic that if the entire United States went completely vegan, we would only reduce our carbon footprint by 2.6%, which I think is a lot less than what people maybe assume. I think they think that number would be bigger. And I'm not saying 2.6 isn't nothing, but it's, it's not as much as, as you would think. And the issue is, is we'd actually create some pretty big nutrient um, deficiencies and our calorie intake would go up. And that is a part of the conversation I think that gets left off a lot is if you're going to be consuming a plant-based diet and getting all of the nutrients you need, a lot of times that means more calories, not less calories. And I think as a society, like, again, that American diet, we don't necessarily need more calories. Like we need more nutrient dense foods. And when you look at that American diet, it's actually very like quote unquote plant-based. A lot of what we eat is plant-based because you have to think like the breads and the pastas and and all those carbs we eat are actually plant-based. It's not as much animal protein because animal proteins are like the more nutrient dense, low calorie foods. Yeah. uh, You see the visuals all the time on social media. You know, you could eat a hundred grams of beef and to get the same amount of nutrients, you'd have to eat, you know, XYZ pounds of broccoli or, you know, you name the plant. I mean, they've, you know, people have tried to try to do those visuals. And, uh, I think I've seen even diet doctor who was very, you know, pro ketogenic diet, they're kind of, you know, swaying now into, um, satiety calories. I mean, I think we have a, a hunger problem because we're not giving our body what it needs. And so I, I'm starting to see kind of in the metabolic world, this push towards, you know, nutrient per calorie, calorie for satiety and, and that that's what matters most, you know, when it comes to what's wrong with our diets. The other missing piece when it comes to like animal and 
proteins versus plant proteins is that also animal proteins are absorbed more readily. Um, they're like more readily available. So our bodies can digest them a lot easier and absorb them a lot easier, um, which I think is a little bit missed in the conversation too. Yeah. Tara, you brought up game changers for my followers. This was so long ago. So some of my new followers probably don't even know that this happened, but when game changers came out, um, they, I don't know if you guys remember, they had them eat the burritos and they drew their blood and they were like, oh, this amazing visual. They put the test tube up there. Look, you can see the fat in the blood, that fat right there. It's clogging all their arteries. So I, I was like, this isn't fair because if you eat carbs and fat together, uh, versus just the carbs by themselves with no fat, of course it looks like that. Um, it's not because the fat. So I did the reverse experiment. It was just an N of one experiment. You guys could find this, but you'd have to scroll way far back on my Instagram, whatever your game changers came out. So I ate a giant plate of eggs and bacon, exactly what they say would like clog your arteries. Right. And so I ate it. And then I think it was like an hour later, I had the girls in my office, draw my blood. We put it in centrifuge, spun it down. We got a good picture of it. And then I went, um, and I got a, a vegan burrito I don't know if I went to Chipotle. I can't remember, but it had rice. It had all the veggies in it. And then I believe I used coconut oil for the fat source. So what we did was we equated the same amount of fat in both meals. So however much fat my bacon and eggs had, I counted up how much that was. And that was how many packets of coconut oil I put in the burrito. And so I put it in there and then I did the same thing, drew my blood like an hour later and the vegan coconut oil burrito had foggy plasma because of the the triglycerides, the, the fat in there, because your body uses everything in what we call oxidative priority. So if you put a ton of carbs and fat in the system at the same time, of course the fat hangs around because it's trying to figure out which fuel to deal with. But if you eat them in isolation, it, it doesn't do that. So anyway, stupid game changers. <laughs> that's fascinating. <laughs> but that's the issue with so many of these documentaries is they give you like a little piece or like you said, a really great visual and you can't unsee oh, yeah. that. Like you, it, you're like, Oh my gosh. Like I think when we were debunking it, I wrote in my notes, like, gosh, it's very convincing. Like at one point I was like, wait, should, should I be plant-based? Like I'm so I feel like so yeah. conflicted and like it, they do a really good job of presenting it in a very visually compelling and also like fear based way. A hundred percent. I'll never forget being in elementary school when the dare, do you guys have dare? Do you know what I'm talking about? Don't it's like the oh, don't yeah. do drugs dare program, but they brought in, uh, like, uh, these smokers lungs, like, uh, saran wrapped in like a, they were like from the pathology department. They're like, this is what your lungs will look like if you smoke. Like I've never picked up a cigarette in my life since that day. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, <laughs> I mean, it, it's true though. Humans are really visual creatures. So it's like to see that it's like, Oh, oh my gosh. And I'll never forget too. As a doctor, we did anatomical dissection. So people donate their body to science. We do this full anatomical dissection when you're going through medical school. And I will never forget cutting into, I actually had it come up in a Facebook memory. I was cutting into the arteries and I saw the atherosclerosis, you know, inside the arteries. You guys, I put on my, this did not age well, on my Facebook post, it was like, oh my God, I cut open these arteries today. I saw this atherosclerosis. I am definitely never going to eat saturated fat again. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That's what my Facebook post said. So, um, but it's true. Did like those things well. just are like em <laughs> emblazoned in your, hey, we all learn. So, it um, is going yeah. back to your original question though of, you know, where, did, how did we get to this point in society basically where meat is the bad guy um, and plants are the good guy? Um, I do think it's because of this, because emotion, when it comes to food, you know, the ag and food mm -hmm. industry is, I feel like one of the only industries where science and emotion are on like a level playing field, right? Like usually everything else, like the numbers overrule, you're going to go with the, you know, the science back information, whether you feel, you know, emotionally different about it or not. But when it comes to our food and what we're putting in our bodies and feeding our family, it's like the emotion kind of overrules everything else. And whether you are faced with the facts, like, Sometimes you just can't confront it. Like you, when they prey on that fear and the emotion, it's really hard to over like overcome it. Yeah. One of my good friends, Gabrielle Lyon, uh, you know, she talks all the time. People are emotional because their food has a face and it's because we are so far removed from our food sources. Uh, Bill Schindler gave this incredible talk at low carb Denver this last year about how we need to get back closer to the, the sources of our food. We used to hunt animals. We used to have to use a mortar and pestle to grind the grains. We had so much appreciation for our food and our nutrition and where it came from. And these days you can literally pick up your phone and Uber Eats 
some sort of garbage right to your front door. And we're so far removed from that. I remember my kids one time when they were little, I love like national geographic and this, you know, the, the wolf comes down the prairie and he's like about to like, you know, eat the baby animal. And my girls were like, Oh my God. Um, <laughs> but it's because like we, we patty cake, you know, we, I mean, this yeah. is nature. Like this is nature. Like the wolves are eating the baby bison. Um, and so, and, but the ag industry, you know, growing fruits and vegetables is killing animals too. Can you tell people about that? Cause I think sometimes people like to pretend no animals are harmed in the pl- plant-based diets. Yeah, I think if people, I, I agree with you that people are very removed from agriculture and it brings up a lot of questions. It brings up a lot of fear. I mean, Natalie and I talk about how, like, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm a conven- conventional dairy farmer. I buy conventional milk at the grocery store because I know what goes into making it and I feel really good and safe about it. I mean, I typically don't get beef from the grocery store because we obviously harvest our own animals. But if I did, like, I wouldn't fear whatever piece of steak I picked up at the grocery store just because I know the farmers that are, you know, or the ranchers that raise that piece of meat, like it doesn't, it it doesn't have that impact on me because I have like the knowledge base to lean against. And I think one of the things about the plant-based world going to that same narrative is I think that when people think they're eating plants, they think of like a small local farm and like a carrot that's being like just plucked from the ground. And if you watch videos online, like there's nothing wrong with how it's being produced, but it is very industrialized too. I mean, it's massive acres of food, like I mean, what goes into harvesting them is either, you know, a lot, some things are handpicked still. So you have tons of people out there picking things by hand, which has a face and emotions as well. You know, like there's people behind that, or it's a big piece of machinery that is harvesting something. And again, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. I just don't think that's the picture that comes to mind when people think about plant-based foods uh, in the same way it does for animal-based foods. And you mentioned like the killing of the animals. Yeah. When you plant a plant in the ground, I mean, you have to make sure that field is level. And so you're, you know, you're knocking anything down. You're knocking any trees down, any brush, any shrubs. Um, you're obviously getting the soil ready, tilling it. You know, there's machinery that's going across the land. Like it is, there's a lot going on. And so anything like, you know, from the bugs and the beetles and the soil are being disrupted or killed to, you know, the deer and the coyotes and the rabbits and the mice and all of those things too are being disrupted. So it's not like it's a blood free diet as like, I think, you know, the vegan kind of animal activists like to paint that picture. Whereas I'll let Natalie jump in on what her, you know, what it looks like out at pasture where ruminant animals are like a piece of nature. Yeah, we were actually went out to summer pasture this morning just to check through, you know, drive through one of the pastures and check on the herd out there. And on the way there, we saw a coyote, we saw a handful of deer, we saw bunnies, um, and we saw a plethora of different birds, you know, um, and that's just at like the, I guess, mammal level of it. If we got down into like the grasses, I'm, I don't even know how many, you know, thousands, millions of things we have growing in the soil. Um, if I was to drive through, you know, the opposite, a, a monoculture field of corn or soybeans or anything like that, um, you would not be seeing, you know, what I just described popping out of it. You know, um, that is one of the the hard things about, again, plant agriculture, which is why I like feel like um, veganism is a little bit hypocritical is because if you, you know, it does rely on like the number one ingredient in Beyond Beef is soy, right? And so it does rely on that, you know, monoculture crop to be grown. Um, and that is, you know, in my, my opinion, if you were to compare the soil of that, I mean, you'll have farmers who are doing a really, really good job of it, but uh, there's just nothing that compares to, you know, an animal out of grass, um, in a ruminant system. And so I think it's just really hypocritical to villainize that cow out at pasture, um, and, and, you know, say that the soy that was being grown was better for the planet. Yeah, I did a post on almond milk one time. <laughs> the, the just the cost and the, the like to actually make almond milk, um, like the energy required and how many almonds are required to make a carton of almond milk and the water required, the natural resources. Like it's um, yeah. Once again, you live in this fantasy world because you go to IV and you just pick it up and put it in your grocery cart and you don't really understand from you know where it originated from and what it took to get to your shopping cart. And yeah, I that brings at- Oh, go ahead, Tara. That brings up a really good point. It goes back to something you were talking about, like the nutrient density of foods. When we talk about emissions, we love to just, I'll use the almond versus cow's milk uh, analogy. Like we love to see those graphs, again, very visual that like one gallon of cow's milk has this many emissions, use this much water, this much land, and um, soy is this much or almond is this much. 
But one of the things that I'm a big advocate for, let's not compare a gallon of milk to a gallon of almond milk. Let's compare the protein. How much protein are you getting out of that cow's milk versus that almond milk or how many micronutrients? Because then that makes the emissions look completely different. Because if you're in the emissions from almond milk, if you're still going to have to go and get the protein from another source, that's more emissions for like the same amount of actual nutrients. And so that nutrient density, I think, has to come into play from a emission standpoint. And what I was going to add, I think it's really important when we're like getting into these level of conversation, I guess, is like, I don't mean to like point the finger at one sector of agriculture versus the other and say like one is better and one is worse. They're just different. And I heard, um, her name's Valentine. Um, she's kind of bigger in like the sustainable seafood area. And she was on Joe Rogan podcast and he asked her, you know, what should we be choosing if we want to eat sustainably when it comes to seafood? And she said, that's not the right way to word that the way you should be asking me is like, tell me your values when it comes to sustainability. And then I'll tell you what to eat. Cause she's like, if you care about, care about, you know, slave labor, you're going to choose a different fish. Like there are like, we're not denying that some are done that way. If you're concerned about marine life, you're going to choose a different fish. If you're concerned about, you know, the carbon emissions, we're going to choose a different fish. And I feel like it's the same thing with agriculture. Like, do you care about, you know, the grasslands, it's going to be a different option than if you care about um, like macadamia nuts. That's um, actually horrible when it comes to uh, labor on, um, you know, usually the women's hands that are doing it. And so there's just a lot to consider about the inputs and the outputs. And people, I think we're at this point in society where we want to just put in these clean boxes and be like, this one's good and this one's bad. And it's like, well, no, there's a lot of conversation about um, cow's milk versus almond milk or soy milk versus, you know, like all of them have different inputs, outputs, and we're not like considering that or having those conversations. Interesting. Interesting. And, you know, another argument is that, you know, seasonably, seasonably fruits and vegetables get shipped all around the world from other countries, um, you know, also contributing to greenhouse gas emissions. What is the, I, this is a completely, I don't know the answer to this question, but in the beef industry, I know there is some uh, import export going on globally, the United States. What do either of you know, kind of what role we play in that? Yeah, so we do have some beef imports. Um, and, you know, I don't know, I'll let Natalie come in with her, the beef side on the imports. I don't know the percentages. Um, I definitely know we're, we don't um, import more than we export, right? And I do oh. know that what we import is actually uh, for lean trimmings. Like we're not importing whole cuts or we're not importing cattle for like our steaks and our roasts and things like that what we're importing cattle for is to mix into the ground beef, like the mixed products so that you can get that uh, lean ratio that people want at the grocery store, whether it's like 70, 30 or 80, you know, 80, 20, I don't know which one people prefer, but that's what they're using those lean trimmings for. And that's typically what the cattle are imported for. And I will say that is one of the big differences um, between like people who want to shop direct to consumer, um, you know, so like buying, locally from a rancher that you know, or like the farmer's market, those are going to be whole animal products across the board. So your steaks, your roasts, your hamburger, it's all going to come from one animal, one animal alone. Um, whereas at the grocery store, your whole cuts would be from one animal. Again, like I, I don't think you'd be eating, um, well, you wouldn't ever be eating like a melted steak or anything like that. But the hamburger that's in the grocery store typically is like a melted product. Yeah. Yeah. We buy our cows half at a time. <laughs> <laughs> on the dairy side, it's actually a fun fact. Uh, it, dairy is one of the most, like if you buy just the regular old milk at the grocery store, it's one of the most local products you can get. It usually comes from a farm less than 100 miles on average from that grocery store. Um, so just like a very, like obviously it's a, a perishable product and it's a liquid, so it's just not shipped very far. So it's one of those products like buying local, you, can, you don't have to feel like you have to go to a farmer's market. You can just go to your local grocery store. Interesting. Okay. We're going to pivot into the last part of the podcast, you guys, which we call the semen analysis. And I can't help myself. Uh, we have to talk about the fake meats. Uh, <laughs> he mentioned beyond meat one time in the podcast, but we're just seeing, um, which I, I don't understand. Um, if you want a burger patty, just eat a burger patty. I don't get it, but, um, talk to us about this industry lab grown meat meat alternatives. Maybe you're just not touching it with a 10 foot pole and that answer is okay too. <laughs> 
I mean, I think that um, I've said it before, but I'll say it again that Natalie and I both believe in food choice and people can choose what they want. I think my big stance on this is like, don't tell me that the Beyond Burger is healthier or more sustainable than a regular steak. Like if you choose to eat that, that's fine. But you need to acknowledge like all the ingredients that go into it, what it took to produce it. Um, And it does not make it healthier or more sustainable just because it has the word plant based on it. And from the lab grown meat side, I mean, a study just came out that right now, I mean, lab grown meat, they were saying it's more sustainable. I I think if you just thought about the basic processes, it's pretty like pretty common sense that it's not. But the study came out that it's 25 times more emissions for lab grown meat than traditional um, or conventional meat. Uh, And so there's just a lot of misrepresentation that that plant based label does not mean what people think it means going back to that conversation. Wow. Natalie, your two cents. Yeah, they actually just uh, announced recently that chicken has been approved, like lab-grown chicken. Um, and I was watching a segment on the news and um, it was like over 50%. We're like, I will never try that or touch that. Um, so I don't, you know, I don't... <laughs> I don't know who the people are that are interested in it. Like Tara already said multiple times, we stand for food choice. So if that was an option, someone wanted to, you know, feed themselves and their families. Um, you know, I, I never want to tell people what to eat. I, it's just important to me that they, I put out information that helps them make the right choices. Um, and I think if they had the information that talked about the sustainability footprint and then also had the information that really told them the truth about the nutrition status of it, I don't think they would be choosing that option. I think it's just like kind of misguided intentions. Yeah. I think there's clever marketing and I think, um, kind of back to your, uh, example you gave earlier, it's kind of like, what do you value? Cause I think it's hard. Sometimes patients are like, uh, well, it's for ethical reasons. So it's like, okay, is it your health or is it ethics? Um, I mean, my two cents is that this whole fake meat thing, thinking that it can replace our meat industry is just naive, really, honestly. Um, I found a fact out there showing the cost production of a single pound of this new lab grown meat is $10,000. So that's what it, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, obviously in its early stages, but to think that that is sustainable is out in left field. Um, and that would of course be very unaffordable to, um, the vast majority of people that we're trying to feed it, uh, you know, as low cost as possible. Um, I think that it's, you know, counterintuitive to think that uh, it's not a processed food. You know, we we hear this all the time, whole foods, whole foods, whole foods. When you look at the ingredient list, um, like I pulled one from just one fake meat. I won't say who it is, but water, pea protein, canola oil, coconut oil, rice protein, flavoring, methyl cellulose, potato starch, apple extract, color, maltodextrin, pomegranate extract, salt, potassium salt, concentrated lemon juice, sunflower, lecithin, vinegar, carrot powder. So these ingredients come from somewhere. And a lot of these are plant derived. Well, they're all plant derived, whatever it's a plant-based burger, but these things are not easily yielded, curated. I mean, it's not like there's just some magical carrot powder, uh, you know, like (laughs) just go pluck the carrot powder from the tree. Like, I mean, these things all have, you know, a cost of production and things like that. And so if we're really trying to overall reduce these greenhouse gas emissions, if that's really the goal, just the you know, sheer production of the the process of these cellular meats and processed meats and things like that is just, you know, that's a fairy tale that you're trying to get people to believe. Tara and I always joke that a fake, you know, uh, plant-based meat or uh, lab-grown meat is like actual factory farming. <laughs> like if you want to see a factory a farm, factory go into farm one of those. It burger. really is a factory farmed burger. Um, yeah. But it brings up, I think, like, you know, you were really honing in on the nutritional side of it. Um, and I think there's like some big topic conversations that are just starting to be had when it comes to, um, you know, these grown, you know, bake, whatever, whichever, whatever you want to call it, the, the lab grown meat or the plant, the plant based meat. Um, two things. One is food sovereignty. So we talked a little bit this out on our podcast, Discover Ag, but Italy actually banned lab grown meat and it was to honor and keep intact uh, their country's food sovereignty. And I think that's really important. And we're actually, I think, really losing sight of that um, when it comes to like the culture of our food. And then two is the discussion around like patents for meat and like owning foods, um, which is essentially what would happen in some of these cases of, you know, factory fish and factory chicken. Um, and I think that's a really scary, really scary road to go down is, um, the patents people could have, um, 
which obviously opens up a very <laughs> big discussion around food yeah. ownership and control, um, which I always say at the very end of the day, it's most important that as the U.S., we just remain, um, you know, a self-sufficient <laughs> uh, nation that can feed ourselves. Um, and so those are also things that really scare me about some of those um, lab-grown meats. I never even thought about that. Well, uh, Tara, Natalie, tell people where they can find you, where they can find your podcast, how they can follow each of you on social media. Yeah. If you listen to podcasts, which obviously you're listening here, then you are a podcast person. And we have a podcast called Discover Ag, and we cover the top trending news uh, articles around food and agriculture. So right now, lab-grown meat, I just got a notification on my computer, like lab-grown meat from Forbes. You know, those are the kind of headlines that we are covering over there on Discover Ag. And then you can follow us on our personal channels on social media. I'm at Tara Vanderdusen. Um, and I'm at Natalie Kavoric. Awesome. Well, ladies, this was such a good conversation. And I love seeing women in ag. I think as I will admit, like as a little girl, farmers were men. And I have connected with so many women in this industry that are out there putting in the work and they're so smart and savvy too. So they're spreading such good information and content on social media, which is really honestly how we reach people now. Um, it's, you know, love it or hate it. It can be a double-edged sword, but, um, hopefully, hopefully you guys are, are, uh, net positive on what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so I really appreciate the conversation. Hey, thank you guys for listening and please share this with somebody in your life. We rely on you to spread these messages around the world. We'll catch you on the next episode. Did you guys love that last episode of the Fit and Fabulous podcast? Well, of course you did. And I want to keep bringing you the most amazing content from the most incredible people. And you can help me by subscribing to the Dr. Fit and Fabulous channel. You guys know where the button is. Just click it. It's the doctor's orders.